I'm going to go right to the section that we're looking at. Last week, we talked about the incarnation of Christ and what that means that the author now has written himself into this drama. Uh, no longer on the outside sending in messages, but God himself comes. And we would not know God to the degree that we do apart from Christ coming. And you remember the disciples in John 14 said, show us the Father. And what did Jesus say? Look at me. You know, uh, look at me because I and the Father are one. And the glorious thing is that we don't have to climb up into heaven and somehow peek through the windows and come to know God. But God came down to us, came into our world. Christ came into our flesh. And when he ascended into heaven, what we're going to look at today is he sent his Holy Spirit to not just come on the earth, but to come and indwell his people. So tonight we're going to look at the new covenant, the Spirit arrives. Next week we look at the final curtain. Uh, one of the most critical things is relating Old Testament to New Testament. And all the essential differences and theological views have to do with the differences in the way that we relate that. So there have been some questions raised about this, and I thought it would be helpful tonight to just do a quick overview of what the three models are. In the evangelical church, you essentially have three models, and when I say models, it's a, essentially a way, a structure of understanding Old Testament and New Testament as we move from the law then to the coming of Christ. One of those models is dispensational theology. Now we're going to come back and say a little bit more about that. The other model is covenant theology. And the third uh, model is New Covenant theology. Uh, uh, Gentry and Wellam call that progressive covenantalism, but I'm a little more comfortable with uh, New Covenant theology. Uh, do you notice, uh, anybody recognize, I know it's kind of small there, do you recognize the diagram up there in the corner? Any of you ever see uh, Clarence Larkin's big book on dispensationalism. It's chart after chart after chart. When I was a boy, I attended a church and we had probably a 40-foot chart that was about six or eight feet uh, high all across the front of the church setting out the seven dispensations. And so dispensational theology has a, a long and a, uh, a, a very strong and forceful pedigree. And I want to set out essentially what dispensationalism sets forth. Dispensation is taken from a word in the New Testament, uh, oikonia, that means economy. Uh, it, it is uh, uh, various ways that God is working. And in fact, it's not unique to dispensation. Every other approach takes that as well. But that kind of frames that. And at the heart of dispensational theology is the view that the church and Israel always remain as two distinct entities or two distinct people. Now, we're going to see how that's changed slightly as it's modified, but in classic dispensationalism, Israel and the church are two separate entities. Israel's future in life is on this earth. The church is, uh, their presence is going to be in heaven. So there's an earthly people and there is a heavenly people. There is strong emphasis on discontinuity between the old and the new. Uh, M.R. DeHaan, I remember uh, years ago when I was in Bible college, getting a book that was entitled Law or Grace. You know, is it the Old Testament law or is it the grace of the gospel? And so dispensationalism will really emphasize the discontinuity between the new and the old. Very central in dispensational thought is the distinct natural future for Israel. 
and the land is central in that. There is very, very strong commitment to the fact that Israel is going to receive the land of Palestine and that uh, they're going to rebuild the temple. Ezekiel 40 through 48 is a, a central passage in that. Now, I, I want to pause in a moment. Let me uh, and get some comments or questions. There are differences within dispensational theology as it's developed. There is classic dispensationalism, and this is the old Schofield Reference Bible. How many of you grew up with the Schofield Reference Bible? Yeah, I grew up with it. I was so proud when I got my grandfather. He was a preacher for years, and I got his old Schofield Reference Bible. Lewis Berry Chafer has an eight-volume set on theology. Darby, uh, one of the early brethren, a uh, brilliant man, they were all committed to a classic view of dispensationalism, and that really separates in a very strong way Israel and the church. Probably in the 50s, there was a revised form of dispensationalism, and under early dis classic dispensationalism, the kingdom, uh, when you read uh, uh, the passages in Matthew, uh, where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God is like this. That's always seen to be something future. That's millennial kingdom. No kingdom now, all of that's future. Revised dispensationalism rolled that back a bit, and they recognize there's some sense in which the kingdom is present now. And so you had uh, John Walvoord and Charles Ryrie out of Dallas that began to modify that slightly. And then more recently, there's what's called progressive dispensationalism, that they move farther away from that hard classic position, seeing them so different. Uh, Blazing and Bach and Saucy are some of the people that have been the strong proponents of that. Now what's interesting is there has been a movement toward the center where you know, there was a very strong distinction from covenant theology. In fact, both of them have moved toward the center. And uh, John Feinberg wrote a book called Continuity and Discontinuity, where he had a series of questions that he had people from both sides uh, answer, and it's really quite surprising what you're going to find there. I grew up under dispensationalism. Uh, some of you here have probably uh, been exposed to that. Uh, probably some of you don't, don't even know what it is. That's what you were taught because that was the dominant position. And uh, I, I really would encourage you to look at uh, Gentry and Wellam, uh, the section that Steve Wellam does. He does an excellent job opening this up. This would take hours to thoroughly do that. So all I can do is give a quick overview and pause and say, okay, any comments, any questions in terms of clarifying that? Any? Well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so far as uh, dispensationalism goes, uh, I think it's, uh, I forget the woman's <coughs> name, but she, she claimed to have had a vision and uh, this could all be John Nelson and Arby talked with us, and so they thought it was some new thing, you know, the, you know, the, this particular century just happened to spawn a whole lot of other movements. They called it, you know, what the, this century was mad with the millennia. If John MacArthur was doing his Charismatic Chaos uh, series and the Strange Fire series, he's sort of denying the horse that he rides in on if he's a dispensationalist because the origin of to have a revelation yeah. about the Bible, whereas John Carver doesn't believe that revelation right. is still being given. So well, would you say that there are dispensationalists that don't believe that revelation is being given? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of people that have bought into that system. It makes sense to them. It puts together a piece of the Bible. I, I, I think the two things that made it so powerful were the, the illustrations that uh, Larkin developed and the Schofield Reference Bible. You know, 
everybody now, there's a, you know, what, two dozen study Bibles, MacArthur has one, Sproul has one, you know, one day I'll write the Gary Scott study Bible and, you know, 12 people will buy it, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, but the Schofield Reference Bible was really influential in kind of cementing that thought in. So, you know, to, to agree with that or to agree with some form of that doesn't mean you have to accept that, you know, the origin of that, how that came about. Dispensationalism really is rather short in terms of its history, you know, and it started at the end of the 18, 1800s. I don't have an exact date. Any other comments, questions? Okay, let's take a moment and look at covenant theology. Covenant theology, uh, it's really set out clearly in the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty well defined. Many of those from a Presbyterian background and a Reformed background are strongly committed to covenant theology. You know, it can be uh, very doctrinaire or it can be very common sense. There are different levels in this. But let me set out some of the key points of covenant theology. The first is that covenant is central to God's interaction with men. Where dispensationalism focuses on the development of the dispensations, covenant theology focuses on the centrality of God's covenantal relationship with man. <coughs> there really are three of them. There's the covenant of redemption, there is the covenant of works, and there's the covenant of grace. The covenant of redemption is the covenant that God the Father and God the Son made before anything existed to create a world and then to redeem the world that would fall. The covenant of works is the covenant that God made with Adam, said if you do this, then uh, uh, here are the benefits that's going to come. He messed that up, and then what follows is the covenant of grace. So all of the rest of the covenants in Scripture from Noah, Abraham on are part of the covenant of grace. And it's been very hard for some to say, how is the Mosaic covenant do this and you'll live? How is that part of the covenant of grace? But that is essential to their reading of Scripture. And you have two of those, the covenant of redemption, the covenant of grace, that are, uh, uh, are not specifically covenants that are mentioned in Scripture. And even the covenant of works is the question is raised by some. Let me set out the basic tenets of that. And it, it's in sharp distinction with dispensationalism. The church and Israel are the same people of God. Where dispensationalism sets them apart, covenant theology brings them together. So the Old Testament church and the New Testament church would be language that they're very comfortable with. They emphasize, I'm sorry, I, I miswrote that. They emphasize continuity not discontinuity. They, they want to bring everything together and they work very hard to make it all fit so that there's no major change between the old and the new. It's just that now in the new we get more than what we had in the old. They maintain the centrality of the seed. The key for them is the promise that Abraham would have a seed, where to dispensationalism, the key to that was that uh, Israel would be in the land. And that's why it's so important for their covenant children, pedo baptism, all the other things that are part of covenant theology. It is all woven together. Uh, I went to uh, uh, a seminary that had a modified view of covenant theology. And so in, I grew up with dispensationalism, went to a Bible college that was dispensational. I went to a seminary that was committed to covenant theology. And it was a very good experience for me now to hear, uh, I heard that from a dispensational side. But it's very hard if you're a dispensationalist to give a fair statement of what covenant theology is. Just as the, 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 the opposite is true, covenant theology theologians can't give you a very clear statement of dispensationalism. So I, I really began to understand uh, what that was while I was in seminary. I came out of seminary convinced they're both wrong. Uh, there are weaknesses, not they're totally wrong, uh, and if you look at it, you wouldn't say either of them are totally wrong. 
but in fact, as a system that tries to put the pieces together, I think there are real weaknesses that are there. And this becomes the real challenge. How do we make sense of the whole Bible? Okay, let me pause here. Questions on covenant theology? Any questions there? Okay, we'll, we'll go on and, and you feel free to raise them. Yes? Yeah, and they, they would simply say it's a new administration. You know, it's one covenant, but the, it's just administered progressively. You know, uh, uh, every view holds to progressive revelation. So their argument would be it's the same covenant, but it's just, you know, uh, it, it progresses. When I was five, there were a certain set of rules. When I became 12, there were a new set of rules. When I became 18, same parents, same love, same oversight, but because my age changed, and, and that's basically, I think, how they would answer that. Okay, let's take a minute now and look at New Covenant theology. Uh, as I said, Gentry and Wellam call that progressive covenantalism. Uh, the, the central part, and we're going to be looking at this tonight because, again, uh, this is explicit biblical language. This, every time we observe the Lord's table, this is my body which is given for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we see that, we're going to look at the language, and in fact, one of the, the homework assignments uh, uh, encourages you to go to a concordance, find every place where new covenant is used, and track that down. At the heart of new covenant theology, it differs from dispensationalism that says Israel and the church are totally separate. It differs from covenant theology that say they're essentially the same, and it says, in fact, the church corresponds typologically to Israel. There's a connection there, but it's not the, as dispensationalism or covenant theology will explain it. There's a connection, but the connection is it's a fulfillment. It's a typological fulfillment of what we see in the old. Romans 9, 10, and 11. In a few months, I'm going to be preaching through that. Uh, Daryl is ahead of me on this. So any questions you have about that, you direct to Daryl, and he'll be glad to, to answer that. Uh, the second thing is that there is a better balance between continuity and discontinuity. You know, it's not total discontinuity, it's not total continuity, but I think there's a better balance in recognizing some of the things stay the same. Some of the things change. The food laws change. You know, but it's not okay to commit adultery now in the New Testament. That remains the same. Uh, and so uh, I, I see it as a, uh, uh, what's that in music called when you move from uh, transposition? It's transposed. The principles of the old are transposed by Jesus Christ. Here's an important part. Israel's future merges with the church at the consummation of the new covenant. It's not Israel goes one way, church goes the other way. It's not it's all the same thing, but there's going to be a merging together. Out of the two, there will be this one new man. I'm convinced Romans 9, 10, and 11 is going to set that forth. There are a number of different uh, proponents of new covenant theology, and some are a little wacky in my, ju in my judgment, the others are pretty much online, but we really haven't had a full-scale development of New Covenant theology. There's a few books out there, but nothing like Dispensational and Covenant theology because it's been very recent. Any questions there or comments? Yeah, w one of the guys is John Riesinger for years. Uh, he has written on this. Um, uh, Fred Zaspel, uh, I, I think, does a really good job in setting forth the, the uh, nature of that. Uh, D.A. Carson uh, 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 
has been a very good friend. I think he would identify himself as that. Uh, John Piper, I don't think, would actually use that phrase to define it, but there are many of the things that he says that, uh, that he would be in line with that. Um, there are a couple of books, I'm trying to remember the names, I have them on my shelf, I can see the spine, but I can't remember the authors, but those are some of them. Yes? I've heard of Moeller being characterized as an intracranialist. I don't know. I, I haven't read anything by him that... Okay? Now, I recognize that's way too brief. Uh, look at, at Wellam and Gentry's uh, article on that, and they'll, and they'll give you some resources that you can really go deep into this if you want to. Jim? In my session tonight, I'm, I'm doing an overview of Romans 8, 28 through chapter 11. Okay, you need your take, in, which I'm skirting the issue on it because it's not my purpose and what I'm presenting yeah. to do it. But uh, all Israel will be saved. I believe that. I think that what he's saying there is it's not that every single Israelite is going to be saved, but at the end there's going to be an ingathering of this final consummation that brings them all together. It's a very tough passage, and you have to look at it in its context. And I'm not ready to answer that a few months down the road when I get there. I'm looking at this afresh. I'm actually looking forward to working through that and looking at some of the other answers that are given. Now, what I, what I want to do is to walk you through some critical passage of Scripture. Turn in your Bible with me to Jeremiah 31. If you're a, a memorizer, uh, this is a great section to memorize. Uh, you probably know it uh, already. Uh, Jeremiah 31, verse 1, At that time declares the Lord, I'll be the God of all the clans of Israel. They will be my people. Uh, it says in verse 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. And he goes through and talks about the people of God. And uh, go down to verse 27. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the offspring of men and animals. Remember the context of Jeremiah? Are things good or not so good in Israel? They're not good at all. Bad time. And so here is an encouragement and a promise. The days are coming. Look at verse 28. Just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down. You know, there's a number of passages that talked about just as I delighted to bless you, I delight now to bring judgment on you. That seems a little odd, and yet God says that. Just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, that's what Jeremiah's message is. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, people will no longer say, the father have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. Now watch the passage. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now dispensationalists are very big here. This is not made with the church. This is made with Israel. It's going to remain with the nation of Israel. It will not be like the, co the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. What's he talking about there? Which covenant? Mosaic. The Mosaic covenant. Won't be like that because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them. I, didn't, I wasn't unfaithful to them. They were unfaithful to me. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their heart. Now, this is central and key to the new covenant. The law that was written on the tables of stone is going to be inscribed on the heart. Now, what difference is that going to make? It's no longer external. 
Yeah. It's not going to be imposed from without. It's going to be written within. It's going to flow from within. I'll put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That phrase is a critical phrase used over and over again that identifies God as the covenant God and his people as the ones that are partnered to that covenant. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord. That wasn't true in the old covenant. There were many people that were part of the old covenant that died and went to hell. Okay, being part of that covenant didn't necessarily bring salvation. Not so the new covenant. Everyone of the new covenant is going to know the Lord from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I'll forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now, deserves a lot more than we can say, but I, I want you to go over to the book of Ezekiel. Because Ezekiel 36 and 37, same time frame uh, in uh, the history of the nation of Israel. Uh, this is some of my favorite scripture. Let's pick up at verse 16 of chapter 36. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, how did they do? Were they model tenants? Uh, uh, excellent covenant partners. What does it say? They defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their action. And wherever they went among the nations, no, notice this phrase, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people, and yet they had to leave the land. That's what the other people saw. This is what the other, these are God's people, and they had to leave the land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned, among the nations. Second time he uses that word. Therefore say this to the house of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says, it's not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have, what? Profaned, Profaned among the nations where you've gone. I'll show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Five times you see that word that's used there. Then the nations will know that I am the sovereign Lord when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. For I'll take you out of the nations, I'll gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. Now here he's not talking about after the 70 years of captivity, he's going beyond that. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. Presbyterians love that verse. <laughs> I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. Now watch this. I will give you a new heart. Now how does that connect with Jeremiah? I'm going to write my laws on there. I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You see what God's doing? How did they do in the old? They messed up again and again. God says, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to come and live inside them and cause them to walk in my ways. This is going to work. You know, it's not going to continue to fail. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. There again is the, uh, there is the covenant phrase that's used to identify the people of God. And I want you to notice that he talks about he's going to put his spirit within them. 
The Gospel of John is going to speak about this. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. Again, much more needs to be said about Ezekiel 36. 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones. Everyone loves that passage. Go out and preach to these bones. Can they live? Well, I don't know. You know. Well, uh, and, you know, it, it reminds me of that song, you know, the leg bone was connected to the shin bone, and uh, you know how that goes. I, I think of that every time I read that passage, and it's a picture of, of a dead corpse coming to life. That's the picture of what God did to the nation of Israel. I want to take you next to the most important passage in the New Testament, uh, really in the scripture, in terms of relating the old and the to Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 20. Do not think, I'm at Matthew 5, verse 17. Remember, this is in the context of, uh, he's just given the Beatitudes. He talked about salt and light. After this, he's going to say, you've heard that it's been said, but I say to you, gives us several illustrations of what he's saying here. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them to fulfill them. Three things are critical. What are the law and the prophets? What does it mean to abolish? What does it mean to fulfill? So let's ask the first question. I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. What are the law and the prophets? What's that? Old Testament, the, entire Old Testament. the entire Old Testament scripture. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments here. He's talking about the inscripturated word of God. I haven't come to abolish them. It's not like, you know what, that was a bad idea then. I'm going to start over and do it right. That's not what Jesus said. I didn't come to ab abolish them, just to wipe them out. But what did he come to do? To bring them to fulfillment, to show the direction to which they were pointed. Let me give you an illustration here. Let's say that I go to India for a month to do some gospel ministry, and I take a picture of my five grandchildren with me. You know, and every night before I go to bed or lunchtime, I pull out the picture and I see Jordan and Morgan and Scott and Colin and Caroline, and uh, I think, you know, thank God for the grandchildren he's given me. I put it away, and the next day I look at it again. Well, when I fly back to uh, uh, back home, imagine they're all there at the airport waiting for me, and I walk right past them all and I look at the picture and say, oh, I love Jordan and Morgan and Colin and so forth. You would think, that's a little bit weird. I mean, it's great to have a picture, but when they're there, the picture doesn't really do justice to that. And what those were great pictures, but the reality is here. Why in the world will you go back to the picture now when you can actually see your grandchildren and you can hug them? And it's not as though that was all wrong in the old. It's that now everything that has been promised is coming to fulfillment in Christ. Last week, we looked at the incarnation, the death, burial, the resurrection of Christ, ascends into heaven, and then he pours out the Spirit of God. We're going to get to uh, uh, Acts uh, 2 in a bit. Caleb? Question. Later he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota... Oh, wait, you're getting ahead of me. We haven't got there yet. Okay, hold on. Let's, I, I, want you to, I want you to see the passage. I want you to walk through this. Don't think that I came to abolish them. I came to fulfill. Now, that word fulfill, there are those that say fulfill means that Christ came to explain uh, what it really means and how it was misinterpreted. Is that what fulfill means? There's a sense at times that he does that, but it's more than that. And what it means is Jesus is taking all of those things that were given as a picture and it was bringing them now to the fulfillment. And so this is key to typology. 
typological fulfillment, promise that God made that comes to its fulfillment or fruition. And if you look particularly throughout the, the, the Gospel of Matthew, you'll see that fulfillment again and again and again and again. So it's critical that we get those three concepts, abolish, law and the prophets, and fulfill. Okay? Now we'll go on. We'll come to yours in just a second here. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. What's the law there? Could be. I mean, I'm thinking about who he's talking to, and all they knew were the first five and, well, the Old Testament. Yeah, what does he say above, the law and the prophets? When he talks about the law, he's talking about the same thing. It's just an abbreviated way to say that. He's talking about the Old Testament. Nothing in the Old Testament, nothing in the Scripture is going to disappear until everything is accomplished. And one of the critical questions is, how is Christ going to do that, and when is Christ going to do that? How much was accomplished in his death, burial, and resurrection? How much, how much more uh, are we waiting to, to come to, to take place? And one of the important questions here is uh, uh, there are those who uh, will divide the law into the civil, the ceremonial, and the moral. The moral stays, but the civil and the ceremonial go. That doesn't work with the least letter. You know, the least stroke, it's the yo, the smallest letter of the, the, the Hebrew alphabet. Nothing is going to get lost from that until everything is accomplished. See, and that's the language of movement and fulfillment that comes in the incarnation of Christ and the pouring out of the Spirit. Let's go on. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments, and the question is, is he talking about the commandments in the Old Testament, the commandments that Jesus is going to give? Uh, I think he's talking about the old here, not just the ones that Jesus gives. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we have a man that I've worked with for some time, a new believer, that really struggles with God-giving commandments. You know, he feels like, I'm a Christian now, I have the Spirit of God within, I don't really need all these instructions, that's just going to naturally come out in my life. Not so. We need those instructions. We're going to see what Jesus does with this. Watch where he goes. Um, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me ask you, in five minutes, can we exhaust that and explain all that? No, there is so much there. But one of the things that really helps, if you're wondering, what is this all about? Just keep reading. You've heard that it was said to people long ago, don't murder. Who said that and where? Moses. <coughs> Moses said that. That's one of the ten. Actually, God said that. Moses wrote it down, or uh, communicated it. God actually wrote it down. Don't murder. So is Jesus saying, you know what? That was a bad idea. It's okay to murder now. No. He says, you've heard that it was said, don't murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. That's Old Testament law. An eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, now, if you know anything about Jewish uh, 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 casuistry, you know, they always quoted Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Jeshua, Rabbi Shemai. You notice who Jesus is quoting? It's not Elijah. It's not Moses. It's not David. You know, it's not Jeremiah. I say he has the unique authority because of who he is. But I say to you, you heard that it said, don't murder. But I say to you, watch what he says, 
Anyone who says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anyone who says to his brother, Rock, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And what he does is he doesn't take that and throw it out. He takes that and advances it. So it's more than just sticking a knife in somebody's back. It's having hate in your heart. And you're going to see he does that. You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. I'm good on that. I never committed adultery. What did Jesus say? But I tell you, anyone that looks at a woman lustfully, now what man... Do you know that can say, never done that, never looked, you know, with wrong intent at a beautiful woman that walked by me in the store, saw on the television? Man, it is so much harder. And scripture talks about you shall not commit adultery. That's part of the Ten Commandments. Uh, go down to verse 33. Again, you've heard that it was said uh, to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oath you've made. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? No. He's going to, it's sprinkled with some Ten Commandments and some of the, uh, uh, the code that was set out in, in Exodus 21, 22, and 23. But the point is, each one of those, he takes them and shows what they were pointing to, and he brings them to their fulfillment, <clears throat> to the end for which they always pointed, but they couldn't get there yet because they didn't yet have the Spirit of God. Does that make sense to you? Again, lots more needs to be said about this text of Scripture, but it's absolutely critical that we uh, see how Jesus, notice the last statement up here, Jesus reshapes that law by bringing it to its fulfillment into a new covenant context. You know, so when I was in uh, Bible college, the, the big thing was uh, the law of love. You know, God doesn't give us any commands, he just says love. No, uh, there's all kinds of directives given in the new covenant, just as there was in the old covenant. Now, we have to look at the Apostle Paul. Now, if we've, you feel like we've rushed through these passages, we are going to be sprinting through these. And I wish we had hours to walk through here, uh, but I, I'm going to just give you um, a, a few uh, uh, comments about this that will whet your appetite and send you back here. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, absolutely critical in understanding what Paul is teaching about uh, the new covenant. Let's pick up at chapter 2, verse 12. When I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I didn't find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him for we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one were the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life, and who is equal to such a task? Lots needs to be said there. What he's talking about is this being led in triumph, is being led to your death. This is not some kind of we won and now we're going to be rewarded. This is being led to your death said, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, we, uh, uh, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or for you? You yourselves are our letter written on our heart, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ. Now watch this carefully. The result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Such confidences as ours through Christ before God. Not that we're competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He's made us competent as ministers of what? A new covenant. 
not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter kills, the spirit gives life. Okay, what does he set out here? The law and the spirit uh, uh, stand in contrast, the old and the new. Very often when Paul's talking about law and spirit, he's not talking about just two different dimensions of spirituality, he's talking about the old and the new. In fact, I think that's what he means in Romans where it says that uh, he was a descendant of David according to the flesh, but was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And there are those that say, well, that's his human nature and his divine nature. I don't think so. I think he's talking about the old, you know, and then the new, uh, and throughout the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, where is it, 5, where it says, uh, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. What's he talking about there? Is he talking about the point at which I came to faith in Christ, and all the old junk went and everything became new? That's how most Christians read that. That's not what it's about. It's not about a point in my life where there's a conversion. It's about this redemptive change from the old to the new. The old is gone. The new has come. And therefore, everything is going to become new. And the new has to do with this life in the spirit. Now, we haven't had time. Uh, we didn't take time. Actually, we, we need to go back for just a moment. You remember in the Gospel of John... Go with me back to John. And uh, you remember John the Baptist says, uh, I, I am not the Messiah, but I've come uh, to uh, proclaim him. But the one that God chose is going to do what? Baptize you how? With the Holy Spirit and with fire. Go to John chapter 7, verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If a man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow from within him. What's that all about? By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Notice the marker of before and after. You know, and if you go later in John chapter 14, you remember in this, this great text of scripture beginning at verse 15, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept them because it neither sees him nor knows him. Now watch this, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In chapter 15, he picks up that theme. At the end of John, uh, he talks about the, the Spirit of God, who God is going to give in Acts chapter 2, uh, chapter 1. Wait here until the gift that God has promised you Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God's poured out. Now, we're, we're going to hopefully get back to that, but let's go back to 2 Corinthians uh, for a second. As I, I want you to see this powerful contrast that it gives us after he says we're ministers, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Do you see that? The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death which was engraved in letters on stone came with glory. What's he talking about? What covenant? I'm sorry? Yeah, which covenant is he talking about? Engraved in letters on stone that came with glory. Ten Commandments, Mosaic Covenant. So that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit. Do you see the two? The ministry that brought death, the ministry of the Spirit, the old and the new. Verse 9, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, what did the law do? It just whacked, it's like whack-a-mole, you know? Whack you here, you pop it up, whack you here, whack you here, whack you. The, the law never blessed anyone. 
because nobody could keep the law. So he talks about the ministry that condemns men is glorious. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? You know, what did Paul say? Uh, but now a righteousness that doesn't come from the law has come in. This is the new thing that God has done. Verse 10, what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. That was glorious, but now it's like taking a really bright flashlight in a dark closet and shining it at the sun. It, looked, it hasn't changed the lumens at all, but it looks a whole lot brighter in a dark closet than it does going out and shining it at the sun. And that's what he's explaining. He comes to the end of this, and I love what he says in verse 17. The Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The new covenant just is saturated with the freedom that we have in Christ that, that, that sets us free from the bondage that we had under the old. Now, I've got to take you to Galatians. Galatians 3. I have actually given you a set of notes that I did some time ago that uh, uh, would take several hours to go through these, and I'm giving to you so you can follow up kind of on your own. I'm going to do the very brief Cliff Notes version of this so you can see it in this text. In chapter 3, he asks a series of questions. Uh, Foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I'd like to learn just one thing. Did you receive the Spirit? Now, what are the two options? What's the first one? Observing the law, or option two, believing what you heard. Now, we got two. How did you get the Spirit? Did you do something, or did you believe something? He's going to ask that question again and again. Then he's going to go in verse 6 to Abraham. He said, how did Abraham get this? And you can follow this in the Romans 4 passage as well. How did Abraham get this? Did he do something or did he believe something? What's the key verse in Scripture? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so he makes the point from Abraham and then I want you to notice verse 13. 13 and 14 is absolutely uh, splendid, glorious verses. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now listen to this. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to who? to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through who? So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Now a whole bunch of stuff is contained there. Now he's going to go on in verse 15 to say, brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. No one can set aside or add to a human covenant that's been duly established. Caleb agrees to sell me his car for $10,000, okay? Is that a good deal or not? <laughs> Anyhow, we make this agreement for $10,000. He can't go home and write $12,000. I can't go home and write $6,000. See, once that's established, he can't change it, I can't change it. So he's taking something from life that we understand. Now watch where he's going with this. No one can uh, uh, set aside or add to a human covenant. So it is in this case. The promises were spoken to who? Moses or Abraham? They were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and one person who is Christ. Now we could go off for a month. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later. What's he talking about? The Mosaic law came 430 years after the covenant that was made with Abraham. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. 
If the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on promise. Go to Romans 4 and you'll see that developed even more fully. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? Boy, has this been debated. It was, now watch this, it was added because of transgression until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. It had a beginning point. When was it added? At Sinai. When did it end? When the promise had come. It has a beginning and it has an end. Go down to verse 21. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Do we have a problem in the Bible that the Old Testament is somehow opposed to the New Testament? Absolutely not. If a law had been given that could impart life, righteousness would have come by the law. But the scripture declares the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe, not do something. Now watch this. Before faith came. Now is he talking before I was a Christian? Is he talking about my personal life? talking about redemptive history before Christ came as the object of our faith watch this we were held prisoners by law now David said I delight in the law you know uh, he found great delight in that but Paul says we were prisoners locked up until faith should be revealed now Spurgeon butchers this verse I love Spurgeon but his message is wrong the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ uh, so that we might be justified by faith. Now, I'm going to say that's a very poor translation. The law is not in charge to lead us to Christ. It was that for the time it was in effect from Sinai until Calvary. And it's not to lead us to Christ. It's until Christ. The law was put in charge until Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now it's clear that's what it means because verse 25, now that faith has come, we're no longer under the supervision of the law. Now let me tell you, I spent hundreds of hours looking at this passage of scripture and wrestling with it. And I got 10 minutes left and having given you a chance to respond to this, there is so much here, but I want you to see this. And what it's describing is how this new thing has come. And it's like before we were children under the tutelage of the law, but now that we come to majority, now that we're adopted son, a 12-year-old boy has $100 million that's his. But guess what? He can't spend a dime of it until he turns 18 years of age. That's the age of majority, or 24, whatever the parents said. And then all of that becomes there. That's the picture. And it's setting out how powerful this new covenant is when it came. Now, go back to, uh, I can't even go to Ephesians 2. You have to look at that. Out of the two men, he made one new man. That is a critical passage in terms of what it's describing. But I, 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 I've got to send you back, at least in your mind, to Pentecost, to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, they're all together, and what happens? The Spirit comes just like Jesus said. Everything changes. Remember, Jesus said, it's for your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, what am I going to do? I'm going to send my spirit, who's not just going to come and be here in Jerusalem. Where is he going to be? Inside each one of us. Does that sound like Ezekiel? I'm going to put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my ways. And that's what this is all about. So when you go to the book of Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews, let's just look quickly at Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter uh, 7 and verse 12, 
I'm just going to pick out a couple of these verses. Uh, verse 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still need for another priest uh, to come in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Now the old Puritan view of the law is it never changed. But Hebrews has more pull than the Puritan view of the law because something changed because of this mighty shift from the old to the new. We move from all that was promising now to its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 8. I love this section. Uh, it basically quotes the Jeremiah passage. There had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, Mosaic covenant. No place would have been sought for another, but God found fault. He quotes the uh, 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 Jeremiah 31 passage and then verse 13. By calling this covenant new, he made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, a new and living way opened for us through the veil. What's that all about? It's about the sacrifice of Christ and the curtain being opened. Now, when you put those pieces together, and again, I apologize for just, you know, putting the fire hose down your throat. I want you to catch a little bit of the excitement of this. What it means at the very heart of the new covenant is Jesus promised the Spirit.